Should, should I just start, I suppose? Yes, please. Yeah, so it's nice to be introduced by Facundo because recently I also had the pleasure to introducing Facundo. And so it seems that we are getting into some more intensive scientific contact, even though we are coming from, from very different directions. So my background is, is in geometry and I want to explore the relation between geometry and topology. Of course, might also be helpful for analyzing data, but here for the moment, I'm interested in it for theoretical reasons. And this is joint work with Pavane Joharinat, who is here in Leipzig and with whom I've been collaborating for some time on these questions. And I think the geometric perspective can provide new insight. So I understand I'm supposed to talk for about half an hour or so, but in any case, if you have questions, you not necessarily have to write them all in the chat. You can also simply interrupt me. So to get started, of course, topological data analysis asks when balls in a metric space intersect. The geometric data analysis that I want to talk about asks how much you have to enlarge balls in order to get them to intersect. So the first one is in essence a qualitative question, although then of course in TDA you make it quantitative by looking at the dependence of this on the radia involved. The geometric question by its very nature already is a quantitative one. And in fact, in geometry, typically quantitative notions are captured by the concept of curvature, which is kind of what distinguishes geometry from topology or what was sought for a long time to distinguish geometry from topology, but more and more the concept of curvature gets, gets generalized, enlarged and enriched. And so then it also captures topological aspects. But curvature in geometry somehow quantifies convexity. The more convex things are, the more negative the curvature is, as I will try to explain in more detail. So needs just some notation. We have a metric space, and we assume here that, that it is connected for the moment, past connected, even though later on I will also talk about discrete spaces. So then we can define the length of a continuous pass, hoping that it be finite by cutting up the pass in small pieces and looking at the distances between the endpoints of those pieces and taking the supremum over all such partitions. And then we call the space the length space if the distance between two points is the infimum of the length of the pass between them. And a length space is called geodesic. If any two points can be connected by a shortest curve, that is if that infimum is achieved and becomes a minimum. So the space, the length space is geodesic if the distance is realized by some curve, which we then call the shortest geodesic. Then if you have two points, we can ask whether they have a midpoint. That is a point whose distance to either of them is equal to half of the distance between them. Of course, if you have a geodesic, you can just take the midpoint of the geodesic. Now, space also has been called totally convex if the following condition is satisfied that it's a little more technical, but it will be quite important for our subsequent considerations. Whenever you have balls, about two points, such that the sum of the radii is at least equal to the distance between those two points, then you require that these two balls, and balls are always closed balls here, have a non-empty intersection. 
So the slogan is very simple, two balls that can intersect because the inequality between their radii and the distance between their center points is satisfied actually do intersect. And much of my talk will be about generalizing this to more than two balls. And just as a convention, all radii will be positive in the sequel. It's an exception right at the end of the presentation. So let's just reformulate that. Looks a little more complicated now. So in equation number one, I take the distance from xi to x and divide it by the radius of the ball around xi. Look for which of the two points, x1 or x2, that is bigger. And then I take the infimum over all points in x. So given the radii, I want to make the distance to both points small. Then of course we can take the supremum over all radii, but of course, if you want to do that, you just make the radii as small as possible. So we want to find good points, like the midpoints that we had seen earlier between X1 and X2, and we want to make the radii of the ball small. Of course, when X is complete, you can easily achieve that. And in particular, you can realize this supremum whenever X lies between X1 and X2 in the sense that the sum of the distances is equal to the distance between X1 and X2. That is when the triangle inequality becomes an equality for instance, when X is midpoint between X1 and X2. Yeah, so in other words, you want to find points X that lie between two points X1 and X2. We may not be able to do that, but then our quantities are meant to quantify to what extent that fails. So that is very simple, but the key idea now is to extend this to three and subsequently to arbitrarily many points. So now we have a definition. Geodesic length space is a three point space. If for any three points, you can find a point, one point that is the between any two of those three points. So for any two of the three points, xi and xj, you require that the triangle inequality becomes an equality when you insert this median point M as the third point. Of course, you can also easily rewrite that. So that's that the sum of the distances between our three points is twice the sum of the distances from M to all these three points. And the picture is obvious. Nevertheless, it is drawn here. So M is midpoint between X2, X1, X2, and X3 here. If that if that is, is our metric space. So the metric space really is, 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 is part of, of the tree and not the surrounding Euclidean, Euclidean plane. And in particular, most metric spaces are not tripod spaces. For instance, if you take a remain, non-trivial Riemannian manifold, that is one of dimension at least two, then it does not satisfy the tripod property. That is the Euclidean plane, of course, does not satisfy it. So the question then is, why are tripod spaces interesting and, and useful? But there do exist some examples, metric trees, tripod spaces, <laughs> and more generally, L infinity spaces are tripod spaces. If you equip Cartesian space with an L infinity metric, the tripod property is satisfied, even though geodesic connections usually are far from being unique. 
but you find some connections between any triple of points between the pairs in a triple of points that satisfies the tripod condition. And L1, L1 space of the plane also satisfies it, but L1 spaces in higher dimensions no longer do so. But there is a general class of examples that satisfy this property, and these are the hyperconvex spaces. And as I will try to show to you, these are important as model spaces in geometry and perhaps topology. And so the general strategy here is, I want to quantify the deviation from the tripod property. As I said, most spaces are not tripod spaces. And my geometric question is, to what extent do they fail to be tripod spaces? So let's once more reformulate the tripod property. If you have three points, and again, if you look at closed balls, such that the radii enable an intersection, satisfy the necessary condition for an intersection, and that's the sum of any two radii is at least equal to the distance between the centers. Then in fact, these three balls do have a non-empty intersection. And so the slogan again is simple. In the tripod space, three balls that can intersect because the necessary condition is satisfied, in fact, do intersect. And you have the analogous quantities as before. We look at the distance from X to XI divided by the radius of the ball and try to find the best X here and then takes the supremum over all sets of radii that in fact achieve equality here because these are the best ones. And you can easily then identify the radii for any three distinct points. There's a unique set of radii and they are given by what is called the Gromov products. And the Gromov products again quantify to what extent the triangle inequality fails. So if you have X2 and X3 and insert X1, then you can check to what extent that then gives inequality in the triangle inequality and half of that gives you the radius R1 and similarly for the other points. And so therefore this Supremum of all radii is realized if you choose as your radii as a group of products. And if you find some X, this is infamous attained, then you call that a weighted circumcenter. From a computational perspective, it solves an optimization problem in R3 with respect to the L infinity norm. And coming back to geometry, there are large class of spaces that you have the existence and uniqueness of weighted circumcenters. For example, this is satisfied for triangles and cut zero spaces. These are Alexandrov's generalization of many many faults of non-positive sectional curvature. I will give you the definition in a moment. And this class of spaces was in particular brought to the fore by Gromov. But first I want to give you a general definition. So we had asked for this intersection property with three balls. Now I'm going to ask for it with arbitrary, arbitrarily many balls. So I call, or the space is called hyperconvex. That is not our definition. The space is called hyperconvex. If for any family of points and corresponding radii of balls that satisfy the necessary condition for an intersection, for pairwise intersections, some of the radii is at least as large as the distance between the centers then not only a pairwise intersection, but all the balls have a common intersection point. This is of course a very strong condition. So 
So what we are requiring here is that when balls intersect pairwise, uh, assuming that the space is complete and so on, yeah, then the radii condition gives us pairwise intersections, then they all have a common intersection. So again, the slogan, balls that can intersect because the necessary condition is satisfied, do intersect. That is a hyperconvexity condition. And of course, hyperconvex spaces are tripod spaces because for tripod spaces, we just require that for three balls. Here are some examples of spaces, some of which are hyperconvex and others which are not. On the upper right, we have a metric tree, which is hyperconvex. On the lower left, we have L1 of the plane, which also happens to be hyperconvex. Here I just saw it, saw it for three metric balls. So the metric balls, of course, are these tilted squares, the, the diamonds. And we have three of them that intersect pairwise but then they also have a triple intersection point. On the upper left, you have three balls in Euclidean space and the Euclidean plane. There you see the hyperconvexity condition. In fact, even the tripod condition is not satisfied because these three balls intersect pairwise, which pair intersects in a single point, but we don't have a triple intersection. And on the lower right, you see a situation as a hyperconvexity and in fact the tripod condition fails most miserably. That is the unit circle. We take three equidistant points. If we take balls around them, this radii being equal to half of the distance between two points, then again, we have triple intersections, but you know, uh, we have pairwise intersections but in order to get a triple intersection, you have to double the radii. It's not as drastic in the Euclidean case in the upper left, because there you just have to enlarge the radii a bit to get an intersection. And this is a quantitative aspect to which I want to come now. But first of all, a little bit of history. Hyperconvex spaces were introduced a long time ago by Aronshine and Panic Bhakti. They are complete and contractible to each of their points. So there's no topology there. And they also satisfy a nice extension property. Namely, whenever you have a one Lipschitz map from some subset of a space to X, then this can be extended to a one Lipschitz map that is without increasing the Lipschitz constant to a map from the entire space into this hyperconvex space. And then there was important work of Isbell and rediscovered and generalized by Dress. Every metric space is isometrically embedded into some hyperconvex space, which is called its hyperconvex hull or injective hull. There are many different names because Isbell and Dress introduced it independently. And the hyperconvex hull of a compact space is compact, and the hyperconvex hull of a finite space is a simplicial complex. So you know in which category you are. Even though in general, the determination may be quite difficult. So what does this have to do with topological data analysis? Now I owe you a word of apology because my favorite complex is not the Vietoris Rips complex, it's a Czech complex. And I will mainly talk about the Czech complex. We, we love the Czech complex equally in this seminar. Ah, okay, good, good. So that is, that is reassuring. Yeah. So of course you all know that, just to rec recall it in, in my framework here. We have a couple of balls with some fixed radius. And then whenever two plus one balls have a common intersection, you insert a Q simplex. And then, of course, TDA is about recording how the homology of this complex varies as a function of R, which then is represented by the barcodes. Now, hyperconvex space 
in the hyperconvex space, all such simplices are automatically filled because if you have pairwise intersections, yeah, then you also get a common intersection. And so we don't have local homology. And so now, of course, comes the Viatoris Rips complex that is precisely the condition that implies that the check complex is equal to the Viatoris Rips complex because in Viatoris Rips, you automatically fill in all the simplices regardless of whether there is a corresponding intersection. Now, I want to briefly talk about some variants. You can relax the condition a little. You can call the space delta hyperbolic. If for any family of balls, you don't necessarily get the intersection when the necessary condition is satisfied, but you always get an intersection. You should just enlarge the radii by some fixed number delta. Jorgen, there was a yes. question uh, on the chat. Yeah, okay, Barish. I can. I can see yeah. the chat, good, uh, please ask. Yeah, so Barish is asking, are there any dimension estimates for hyper, hyperconvex holes? No, I mean, no, I mean, the hyperconvex hull can, can, can be a lot, the dimension can, can be a lot higher. So uh, for finitely many points, I guess the uh, dimension can be estimated by the, by the number of points. Yeah, so for, for four points, it's a two-dimensional complex. For six points, it's a three-dimensional complex and, and so on. Thank you. But in general, I mean, if you have a manifold or so, I wouldn't know how to bound the dimension of the hyperconvex hull in terms of the geometry of the space. That is a very difficult question. I, I would love if I could answer that in general, but I, I don't have an answer right now. And it may take quite quite a while before an answer emerges. There's another variant. Instead of adding some constant to the radii, you can also be permitted to enlarge the radii by some fixed factor. Then you call the space lambda hyperconvex. The first one is called delta hyperbolic. Second one is called lambda hyperconvex. If you allow to enlarge the spaces by, by some factor. And for large radii, of course, the small number delta can become insignificant. And so it's good for asymptotic consideration. And it, of course, also then makes sense on, on, on discrete spaces. Yeah, if delta is at least as large as, as, as the nearest distance between two points. The lambda hyperconvexity, of course, has the advantage that it is invariant under scaling the metric. But for data analysis, maybe delta hyperbolicity may be more useful because it naturally applies to discrete spaces. So now, Hilbert spaces can be shown to be square root of two hyperconvex. That is, you have to enlarge balls at most by a, radio, by a factor square root of two in order to get higher order intersections from pairwise ones. In general, you may have to double the radius, for example, in reflexive and dual banner spaces that, that suffices. And in particular for L2 spaces, you can do it. And for finite X and also the L1 space of X is too hyperconvex. There's the L infinity space. All this is one hyperconvex and one hyperconvexity, just this hyperconvexity. And now we can use these concepts to compare spaces with each other, or we can compare them with reference spaces like, like Euclidean space. And in geometry, as already said, this is quantified by the concept of curvature. But we have developed this abstract perspective where curvature relates intersection patterns of balls to convexity properties of distance functions. I will come to that now. Namely, I promised to you already that I give you the definition of 
Alexander of non-positive curvature, and it is given in the figure on the slide. On the left, you have some geodesic triangle in some metric space, and on the right-hand side, you have the comparison triangle in the Euclidean plane. The bars on the side indicate that the lengths of these geodesics are the same. That is, you have a triple of points x1, x2, x3 in our space. You have comparison points x1 bar, x2 bar, x3 bar in the Euclidean plane, such that the pairwise distances are equal between the unbarred and, and the, bar, the barred points. And then non-positive curvature requires, or that is a definition, that if you take any of the points x3 and connect it to some point, for instance, the midpoint of the geodesic connecting the other two points, then this distance is not larger than the corresponding distance in Euclidean space. So in other words, triangles are curved more inwards than in Euclidean space, then you have non-positive Alexandrov curvature. There's another curvature condition, Busemann convexity, which is a weaker condition. It just requires that geodesics diverge at least as fast as in Euclidean space. But for lack of time, let's not go into that too much. Now, our definition says that a space has non-positive curvature. If for each triple in X, and with a comparison triangle in the plane as before, our number is for these three points is not larger than the corresponding number in the Euclidean plane. That is, you don't have to enlarge balls more than you would have to enlarge them in the Euclidean plane in order to get a triple intersection. So here, other definitions again, but let's not spend too much time on that because I explained that already. Uh, so the circumcenter, that is where you get a triple intersection is at least as close to the vertices as in Euclidean space. Yeah, and balls do not need to be enlarged more than in Euclidean space to get a triple intersection. That, that is a property. So the, again, the slogan, balls intersect at least as easily as in Euclidean space and you have non-positive curvature. So of course, tripod spaces then have non-positive curvature because there no enlarging at all is, is needed to get an intersection. So then we have the smallest possible value of this constant. And complete cut zero spaces, that is space of non-positive Alexandrov curvature, also have non-positive curvature in, in our sense, but our condition is more general because our space need not be geodesics, need not have, need not be geodesic and they do not even need, they do not have to have unique geodesics even if they possess geodesics like the L infinity spaces. Alexandrov spaces always have unique geodesics. And of course, an approximate version, again, applies to discrete spaces. And we are also in the process to evaluate that on, on, on some data, but that is not yet completed. And we can also prove the theorem to connect it to the classical theory. A complete Riemannian manifold has non-positive curvature in our sense, if and only if it has non-positive sectional curvature in the classical sense where the curvature is computed from second derivatives of the metric tensor. So now come to conclusions. Then we have a cover, then we can construct a simplicial complex by assigning a simplex whenever corresponding sets in the cover have a non-empty intersection. And as you all know, when all the intersections are contractible, the homology of the resulting simplicial complex, the check complex equals set of X under some whatever very general topological conditions on X. And for that, you don't even need a metric, 
But if you have a metric, of course, you can use covers by distance balls. And as I had explained, when the metric space happens to be hyperconvex, then you always get intersections. And so therefore, all the simplices are filled. And so there are no holes and there's no corresponding homology group. So topologically, these hyperconvex spaces are the simplest possible ones. But if you relax the condition, if you only ask for lambda hyperconvexity for some factor lambda bigger than one, or some delta, delta hyperbolicity for positive delta, then of course, non-trivial homology groups may arise. And so homology then is a topological measure for the deviation from the hyperconvexity model. Homology groups, of course, create algebraic invariants, the Betty, the Betty numbers. But the point I want to make is that geometry provides more refined real valued invariants. And according to Riemann, the fundamental geometric invariants are curvatures. And we have now developed a framework where the essential geometric content of curvature can be extracted for general metric spaces. And our comparison classes, our comparison class are then the extreme spaces, the tripod spaces, which there you always find intersections. You don't have to enlarge anything. And more generally, of course, we have the hyperconvex spaces. So from our perspective, the geometric content of curvature in this abstract setting is a deviation from the tripod condition. And Euclidean spaces are now relegated to a subsidiary role just because the classical normalization of curvature assigns a value zero to them. So they classically sit in the middle of the spectrum, but we look at spaces that look at the, that sit at the extreme, namely the tripod or hyperconvex spaces. And I will conclude with the definition, maybe a little unusual to conclude with the definition, but I think this is a nice and useful definition. So we take an arbitrary metric space and then we construct a gigantic simplicial complex. The vertex set consists of pairs, points in the original space and non-negative. Now I also allow zero and non-negative radii. And then we can consider sets of vertices that is pairs. Now with different xi and positive radii. And whenever the corresponding balls intersect, then our simplicial complex carries a simplex spanned by those vertices. Of course, you can impose constraints or you can look at the topology of the slices where i is equal to constant, i is constant, and then you can vary r that is done in TDA. But I have defined a more general object here. So what can we do? We can develop new schemes for geometric data analysis. We can look at the asymptotic geometry of networks. We are doing that with Arijit Samal, the head of our partner group for mathematical biology in Chennai in India. And we can ask more questions about the geometry of hyperconvex and tripod spaces or of hyperconvex hulls or whatever. And as I already mentioned, this has been joint work with Pavane here at, at my institute. So thank you very much for your attention. I suggest we unmute ourselves to thank Professor Joost. Right, so are Should there I... any comments or questions? Should I unshare the screen? Um, sometimes, uh, I think sometimes people refer to uh, slides 
Okay, so but, uh, you can see I leave it on, sure. Okay. Are there any uh, questions? I'll start with a question. So um, definitely agree that, that your framework incorporates a lot more than topology and, and also the ge geometry. But if I wanted to try to make a statement regarding the topology, um, is it correct to say that in a, in a lambda hyperconvex space, when you build these check complexes and you, um, you know, allow the, um, the radius to vary, that um, being lambda hyperconvex is sort of bounding the length of a persistent homology interval in, in terms of lambda. Is that a correct interpretation? In some sense, yes, except that the radius of the balls can, can vary and so they can, they can be adapted. Now, so ah, if, right. I, if I have three points with different pairwise distances, yeah, then I would adapt the radii to make them equal to the Gromov products. Thanks. I see that uh, Wojciech has, um, has raised his hand. Please go ahead, Wojciech. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so I have a question. So Jorgen, if we look at, let's say, this gamma hyperbolic spaces, in the mm -hmm. space of all, let's say, finite metric spaces, how dense are they? Like what is the, you know, if you take an arbitrary finite metric space, what would be uh, like, what's the neighborhood? What's the, the smallest neighborhood? Let's say with respect to Gromov Hausdorff distance where you can actually find uh, a, a gamma hyperbolic space. Well, I mean, it depends on the value of, of gamma if you take- Yeah, sure, sure. But is it gamma, like, are they, do you expect they to be dense uh, or they are like, you know, very special? Well, I mean, the the family keeps increasing if you increase gamma. So if gamma is equal to one, then of course they are, they are pretty rare. Yeah. But they still could be, they could be rare, but still they could be somehow. I'm just really curious whether yeah. they somehow, uh, you know, they are spread all over. So, you know, you said like, yeah. you know, at that distance, at that gromov hauser distance, every metric, every finite metric space has uh, gamma, you know, one hyperbolic space. In some yeah. sense, yes, because you can approximate spaces by, by, by networks, by graphs. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and so that, that would be a natural way of, well, I mean, graphs satisfy this condition on, on, on only locally. Yeah, they would have to approximate the space by, by, by a tree. Trees, yeah. Yeah. Then, then, then you would have the, the condition. But I suppose you can naturally do that, actually. No, the reason I'm asking is that maybe, you know, because these complexes, you know, Czech yeah. complex is notoriously difficult. Homology of Czech, you know, the whole filtration is notoriously difficult to calculate. But maybe, maybe uh, if we are sort of, you know, if we want to do some up to some error, yeah. Maybe converting them, converting these uh, spaces into, into, I don't know, one hyperbolic would allow us to be a little bit more efficient in calculating yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the check, com you know, homology of check complex. I understand. So that, that, is, that is certainly true. Yeah, I think, I mean, this would be a trivial base of approximating a space by, 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 by a tree here. Yeah. Trying to put, yeah. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm not, I'm not, not sure. I, have, I would have to think. Question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It was a nice talk. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I, I have a question. So, uh, the, the constructions you you showed of uh, for, for the notion of curvature, they utilize uh, three points. Is there any interest in uh, contemplating uh, definitions where you use more than three points? Probably there is. In the classical Romanian geometry, you would expect that, that three points suffice because 
a Riemannian manifold, uh, the metric of a Riemannian manifold is completely characterized as a sectional curvature. And sectional curvatures can be captured by three points. Now, for a more general metric space, it may well be that, that you may need four or even more arbitrarily many points. But so far, I don't have a good example. But I would expect that the answer to your question is yes. Thank you. Um, any more comments or questions? I'll ask another question if there's not others. Um, Jürgen, I was wondering if you could go to the slide with the definition that you ended on. Yes. Right, so um, from the, the TDA perspective, you know, what my TDA instinct wants to do is I want to um, um, either set a universal bound on R, okay? In which case this, this bigger complex, because your vertices are, are indexed by points and R values um, is, is much bigger. But if you set a universal bound on R, then potentially <clears throat> your, um, your larger space you know, might, might sort of collapse down onto the space where all vertices are exact, or where all of the vertices are, <clears throat> you know, uh, where all, all of the R values are, are equal to that, that universal yeah. bound. But, but another, another thing you could do is um, at each point in your space, well, you have a real valued function on your space yeah. and that's yes. sort of the maximum R that's allowed at that point, right? Yeah. And, and maybe there's similar collapses there, but, but is there interest from your perspective to, uh, to ask about the topology of these simplicial complexes when you set either a universal bound on R or you have this real valued function on your space that describes yeah. uh, a bound on R at each point, or is, or is that not so a natural of a question to ask from no, the geometry? No, I think that, 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 that is a good question. I would put it in the following way. Of course, if you look at a compact space and making R bigger than, than the diameter, I will not create any anything new. Now, however, this is interesting for, for getting at, at the local picture because of course, if you have a sample of points from some space, it may, may be much denser somewhere than, than, than at other places. And of course, then you can take a function of R, a function R of the points, uh, which, which reflects that, and then you can flexibly adapt things. So that, that would, would be the interest. So naturally, we would look at making R a function of, of the point and of the local geometry around, around that point. So the, most naive thing would be to let it be a function of the distances to, to its closest neighbors. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, this is a very speculative question, so it may not, it may not make any sense. So you start with a finite metric space or some metric space, and then you construct the simplicial co complexes in the screen. And let's yes. say that, uh, for every simplicial complex, you have some sort of metric. So you uh, distances, etc. So this is a simplicial complex induced by this metric space for each R. So let's say we have this notion of metric on this simplicial complex, and we define some geometrical quantities and mm -hmm. do you for in this not the metric space but in the simplicial complexes uh, construct for each ri here so tda is analyzing these changes in the simplicial complexes topologically so is yeah. there any way complete speculative question the measure the changes in the geometry so we have some metric we have some geometric quantities like uh, some sort of everything is C zero. I know you can't do calculus in there maybe, but do you say? Um, can you say anything about the cha changes in the geometry? What do you think? Well, uh, I want to break up the question into two parts. So first of all, for this simplicial complex I have defined here, there is no natural metric, yes. it's just a topological object. That's why I have the heading translating geometry in, in, into topology. On the other hand, of course, if you have a simplicial complex, then 
it may often carry a natural metric, uh, typically what perhaps equipped uh, simply sees with, with uh, Euclidean metrics. And then, of course, you can apply this, this procedure again. Yeah, out of this simplicial complex, you can then can construct another one according to, the, to this procedure and study its topology. But the procedure does not naturally iterate because the simplicial complex I'm constructing here as that doesn't have a natural metric on, on it. Okay. So All what right. I mean is, I mean, for example, if you have high degree knots, uh, uh, yeah. and then the simplicial complex uh, the dimension is less, it means a very negative curvature. If it if it has a slow degree knots in the simplicial com complex, then if your dimension of the neighborhood is small, you can correspond to some sort of high positive curvature. These changes in here may reflect uh, in somehow, if we can detect these guys uh, yeah. in these special complexes, it might give you some other way to analyze the geometric data in using geometry. That's the speculation I am I trying to iterate here. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's kind of a tr translation. Yeah. So geometry is reflected into the distribution of distances between points, uh, that is what, what the distance function tells you, but it only indirectly encodes the relations between more than, than two points. Yeah, and here I want to have a scheme that makes that relation between more than two points explicit. And then of course, you can, you can ask what happens in the case when the origin space had positive curvature. This is largely un unexplored because so far we have been looking at, at upper curvature bounds, but not really, but we have not really looked at, at lower curvature bounds. But of course, the principle is a comparison principle. You construct, you compare a certain quantity with a corresponding quantity in some model space. I've taken Euclidean space here. You could take spheres or hyperbolic spaces and so far, I've bounded it above from the quantity in the Euclidean space or in whatever other model space you have, but you could also bound it from below with the quantity in by the corresponding quantity in your model space and see what what geometric or topological implications that has. But we have not at all explored that. I think it's a very good question, and one naturally should speculate in in, in that direction. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for the great talk. My, my you, pleasure. Thank you for your attention. I have one uh, final quick question. So do you expect any uh, connection between this uh, simplicial complex and construction similar to the tight span? I mean, I presume the answer would be yes, but I'm wondering if there's anything more uh, direct. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I'm at the same state as you. I think the answer is yes, but we have not, not really lo looked at it in, in, in detail, but clearly this should be the framework in which to, to, to identify the, the type span. Mm -hmm. uh, Hyperconvex hull or but whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Thanks very much. I will uh, stop the recording but I think if people have more questions, we can continue.